Next up, we have Katie Garnier and Jay Van Buren. Jay is an artist and designer from Brooklyn, New York. He was founder and director of New York's Video Land Gallery and has been applying his art and design skills to projects in the educational space for over a decade. He's joined by Katie Garnier, director of the iLabs at Avenues, the World School. She's a tenured adjunct assistant professor at Parsons, where she has taught programming, animation, and interaction design. Hey, good afternoon. Hi. Um, this is our first time at, uh, at this event, and it's really an honor to be here and to be uh, talking with these uh, excellent people. Um, it's very exciting. Um, let's see. Yeah. So we've right. covered this, but um, we also have, besides a pr uh, professional interest in this, we have a personal interest because Jay and I are married, and we produced Theo, who is three years old now, and he could use an iPad before he could talk and he could use it very, very well. So we are very interested. He took that picture. And he took that picture, <laughs> yeah. And you know, so we're very interested personally in creating good experiences in creative technology because our son is gonna be experiencing those. So um, this, what we, what we did started as an assignment from uh, Avenues, the World School. And um, my company, Early Adopter, does uh, content creation. I come out of a fine art background and web design, and I'm kind of approaching augmented reality is the same way in that I'm not interested in building a browser. I'm trying to figure out what can you do with the already existing technology um, and, uh, and just applying it. So uh, Avenues wanted, is, a, is a new school in New York. They wanted to... Um, be able to use the architecture of the school as an interface, and they wanted to create spaces that can act as a ubiquitous and formal classroom. And that's really oh. core to the philosophy of the school is that learning experiences can kind of pop up anywhere. So we created a reusable timeline and map that can be augmented by students and teachers. And the uh, final state of this is going to be a vinyl uh, permanent installation on the walls of the school. Right now, it's still in a paper prototype. Uh, version, but we're, we're already using it and um, playing around with it. Um, and we also, we're going to talk about a little bit about what we have learned in this process and some of the things that we actually were going to uh, agree with a lot of what some of the other people said about why augmented reality for education is really exciting. Um, so the first thing, like I said, we wanted to focus on content creation, not app development. Um, me and a fantastic team of interns over the summer in a, a lightning fast um, getting up to speed on augmented reality period figured out that um, Layer Creator is a really fantastic, um, easy to use interface. When we first saw it, we were like, ah, this is something we can teach kids to use. This is something we can teach teachers to use who don't have any kind of background in this. Um, it's drag and drop. It's very, very easy to use. And it's also very flexible. You can, I mean, I don't know how many of you messed around with Layer Creator, but even just with this web-based tool, you can add uh, links to video, to web pages, to audio, to all kinds of different things. Um, and uh, also, Layer really got what we were doing when we started talking to them, and uh, they were extremely helpful to us. So you want to? Sure. So uh, we wanted, from the very beginning, before we even had a conception of what we were going to do, we you know, sort of had this marching orders of like somehow use the architecture of the school, but to start with the teachers right off. So we worked with three teachers in the upper school. And we started working with these teachers before they'd ever even taught in the school because the school just opened in September. So the three teachers we worked with, a science teacher and our teacher and humanities teacher, who are all now teaching ninth grade. Um, we asked them what they wanted most out of a project like this, and they said flexibility. They wanted something that they could use semester after semester and put new content into it. So they got it. Like, they got it right away, and then they also saw that they didn't want to just do something that they were going to do for this moment, for this semester. They wanted something that they could build upon and that would be really flexible. And something the kids could use, too. Because one of the things that Avenues is really interested in doing, and I think is a, is a principle that's sweeping education, is this whole idea of kids teaching other kids. So that was a really key thing that we wanted to get into. So the map. So the map is a, uh, a, it's a big map with no uh, features, no geographic features other than country borders. That's it. Um, and what's amazing about it is that the country borders are so squiggly that Layar Vision loves it and can easily recognize any of the countries. Um, another thing that's great about it is that it's augmentable at multiple scales. This is something that's true of 
of layer and may be true of some other uh, systems as well that you can you know the, the entire map could be one marker a continent can be a marker an individual country can be a marker so you can have multiple augmentations within the same uh, image we also did a timeline we, we started off with a history uh, uh, basically human history timeline so it starts off with uh, uh, like 5000 BC and runs up to the present and it's it was designed actually to go onto the tiles there there's tiles down the long hallway at avenues and we were going to have every uh, decade be a different tile um, so right now again it's what you're going to see in this video is paper but uh, it, eventually it'll be it's actually attached to the wall um, the way that this uh, works because the the numbers were not distinct enough from each other to be used as as markers basically the um, layer vision was getting confused between you know 3500 and 2500 um, so what we did was run a, a quote all the way down the line a long long quote and we translated it into uh, Chinese and Spanish as well. And the, the long quote makes a non-repeating uh, series of visual images all the way down the line so that each chunk can be a different marker. And I can say, like having watched this process, that that took a lot of iterations to really make it work. Yeah, figuring that out was, was tough. <laughs> um, so um, all right, so now this is, this is just a piece out of a video that we're going to play. Content for the map, the information is going to be actually in the augmented space. Okay, who wants to try it first? I want to have one, one volunteer. Okay, so come on over to the map. You have to get the entire country in your viewfinder. So you have to step back to a point where you have, there you go. Oh, I got it. There you go. Oh, I'm, I'm getting it. Wow. There you go. Okay, now. Just play. Yeah, hit it. Okay. So this is a okay. This so this is a is video that um, this this video is showing a, one of the early lessons that we had installed on the map that was done by the humanities teacher, and it was a project where he had um, different bands from a list that was produced by the Guardian, and um, they were uh, sort of like uh, the hot bands of today in different countries. And what he was trying to do was to get the kids interested in this question of. Are these really the hot bands? Who made this list? You know, uh, is this is this a good list? Um, and getting them to think about it, and also just using the fact that um, kids love music to, you know, get them interested in it. Now, what you saw there was you saw something pop up that was a um, uh, actually a PNG using the um, alpha channel so that we could have uh, transparency and have just the country appear over the top of the map. Um, that's something that we're doing. We ha we actually set create a set of Photoshop documents that the teachers and kids have learned how to use, but it need not be that way. You could actually do what we've done with the, uh, the uh, in, in layers parlance pages. Um, we've created the pages for all the different countries, and that's all uploaded. So they could be augmented with any old picture. You wouldn't have to necessarily create something that was specifically you know, over the country. Um, and let me see, just play this again. This is a song by this band. In a second, and you can actually find out more about the band if you tap the country itself. I love the map that, that Avenues made There's because a little everybody can point their phone at any region There's and they can learn there. something about their region by zooming in on it. Next to that, I mean, one of the other applications is the timeline. And here's the timeline. So the timeline and, and what the school has done with that, I really like because you see this row of lines and numbers and some text with it and it doesn't say anything really. I'd call it boring almost. Yet, if you hold your iPad, your phone, or any, you know, one of the tools that works with layer over it, you get to know, you know what, where those shoes come from. So that shows what it's looking like. So, that, so this was, again, a lesson that was produced by one of the teachers where they had um, uh, different uh, images of, of uh, artworks throughout history that included shoes. And this is just a case study you know, or a, a proof of concept. But essentially, this is a timeline that could be used for any teacher for any topic. Um, and Let's see. I think that's the end of the video. So, yeah. So, um, oh, so now. Right. So uh, we really think the true power of AR and any of this creative technology, and this is very much my mission at the school, is to get the students creating content and kind of teaching back to each other. So we created the AR club to kind of start to seed this notion in the school. Uh, and we actually have two of the students here, and I have them on a Skype call, so hopefully you'll be able to hear them. So just bear with me for a minute, and they're going to explain the project that they did. All right. Hang on one second, guys, because I have to get you uh, have sound again. I turned down the Skype sound yeah, so that you guys wouldn't hear them. Right. 
So hopefully this will work. Say something. Something. <laughs> okay, great. All right, so I, I'm gonna put them on the full screen. So if you guys could just describe the content that you guys created for the map and introduce yourselves as well. Okay, well, I'm Luke. And I'm... And basically it was, we found original work for this country and we didn't go as we Oh, this microphone? Yeah. Hang on one oh. second, guys. Let me just see. Okay. Okay, try try, try again talking explaining again. Lucas. Sorry. Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um so we we didn't create the images, but we wrote descriptions about them and we um what we created was a, a button for each country that we made. And once the um, augmented reality linked to our website, we had the description there. And uh, so basically, how it worked was you would use the layout, the layout, layout app on your Apple iDevice, and you would just scan the picture that or the country that you wanted to look at, and it would show you like uh, first the picture, and yeah, and again, it would show you the parody. So like for China, we had. A picture, a propaganda picture of Chairman Mao, and then if you were to tap on the um, on the picture, then it would take you to the um, parody. Okay. Or the, web, the website with both of them. Yeah, it would take you to the website with both of them, where we show Chairman Mao and the parody, which is a picture of Chairman Meow, who's a cat. So I think everybody missed our the, 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 They can't, but I think you guys can. The content that. Um, the content they created was that they found artworks from countries and then found parody artworks of those. So that's something that you can actually see downstairs on the map that we have posted outside of the exhibit hall. So you can see that content that they created. All right, so um, we're, we're basically agreeing with what some of the other people uh, up here said, which is that learning is really different when you're using your whole body. Um, one of the things I think is really exciting about the timeline is that walking the length of, you know, when you walk from the Stone Age to the Iron Age and you have to walk all the way down the hall to get there, it really makes you see how long that time span is. Um, and with the map, um, there's a difference between looking at a huge wall map. I mean, if you, if you have an enormous wall map of a certain topic, that is a very cool thing to have because you can look at something close up, but you also still have in your peripheral view a general context of the whole um, space and basically what this does is create a huge wall map that can be a wall map about anything um, and um, and then and then the other thing is in both cases you can have multiple kids and you know you were they were uh, you were talking about the um, kids sharing and and that's what we've noticed too is that something about getting them out in space and walking around and using these things makes them collaborate more and you get a lot of kids like you know hey look at this and like showing each other things and talking in a way that they just didn't don't do if they're sitting there at their own computers looking at you know a website or something or like if that. they do it's like disruptive to the classroom experience you know so th so that kind of leads into things that i have noticed as an educator and working with technology in the classroom that's ubiquitous, all of our students have iPads and laptops of their own, that this generation of kids gets bored when you sort of do a traditional lecture where you're leading them through things because they can sit there and Google what you're talking about and then they're like, okay, I know this, I'm done. Um, so if they can get up from their seats and walk around the environment of the school or go outside and look at content and discover it for themselves and have a kind of non-linear experience with it, then you get them focused, they're still using their technology, but you're like drawing them out of that technology into the physical world. So this is something I'm really interested in continuing to explore with AR and other kind of creative technologies. Um, looking forward, one of the things I'm interested in doing is uh, maybe doing a Kickstarter project for a print-on-demand scroll uh, timeline. I'm thinking a different situation with timeline, maybe something with um, uh, like a series of pictograms or something to create the, the timeline that would be uh, printable on demand. Um, timelines for cosmic, geologic, and biological timescales. And also, I, I would love to do a vertical uh, adaptation of this where you could have, you know, the ocean floor is way at the bottom of the staircase and the 
top of the, the water is at the top and it gives someone a sense of like, wow, the ocean is really deep, you know? And, the, and you'd have to walk up. I mean, in yeah. the case of, of our building, it's 10 floors, so you would have to walk up and down to kind of experience all of that. Um, but I think that would work equally well in like a museum context. Right, yeah. It would be we, a wonderful physical metaphor for those layered experiences. And um, lastly, uh, I'm really interested in working with any other uh, educational uh, or institutions on things like this. I mean, this what we did for Avenues was very specific to what Avenues needed in this case, and we basically went into it and said, we're gonna solve this problem creatively, but we would love to work with you know, anyone else out there who's got a, a problem that needs solving and, and a, something that they wanna communicate. And I'm very interested from the Avenues perspective in just working with any companies or institutions who are interested in doing projects like this. So thank you very much. So, does anybody have any questions for the panel? Yeah. Um, it looks like um, for the SESME, I, I know you guys have been working a lot with research in terms of mobile devices, especially with preschoolers. And you guys kind of started that whole trend, the pass back effect. That was some emerging research you did, I believe, in like, what, 2008, um, documenting that. And so one thing I was kind of surprised, because I'm a mobile learning specialist, so I know a lot about this kind of the, the gathering together. So I'm kind of surprised you hadn't ran into that before. And, you know, that collaborative nature that mobile devices allow, um, I'm wondering if you guys are going to take that research a little bit further because it's really important for our, for this particular line of a field to start having that in-depth kind of research. So are you meaning the collaborate, the passback effect in terms of what we found in 2008? in collaboration with the Cooney Center was more of parents are just handing the phones back to their right. children. They're not playing together. It's like it's a child facing solely a single one because of the size of the devices um, primarily. Um, and they just, it's all consuming. You just see kids, you know, stuck to it. Um, so I think this has been something we'll definitely be putting a lot more research into because okay. we're really, we want to create and design in a collaborative play manner. We are always trying to do mm -hmm. stuff like that, um, whether through, it's through the play set that we did last year. And I think having this just pop up naturally in a study when we're not even specifically looking at that, that's where we have like really, really um, good findings. I think p part of the challenge, uh, especially when you're not in, the, in a classroom context, is that when you're requiring collaboration, when you're putting something out there that has to be played by a group or by a parent and child together, then you're gonna limit its reach and ultimately its impact. And so for us as a nonprofit, being mission-driven, um, often when we're looking at uh, limited resources, what projects can we do, um, the ones that would require collaboration or require parental participation do not stay at the top of the list of priorities simply because we can't achieve the same amount of impact with them. Okay, more questions? Oh, one at the back. Hmm. Oh, sorry. Right behind the blinding spotlight. Uh, from a profitability standpoint, um, how do you propose to make money from um, from production costs? Things cost a lot of money often. Whoever wants to answer. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to. Um, <laughs> augmented and mixed reality completely change the economic model th from what it is. Um, the biggest challenge is to change people who do collect money to rethink it. Um, they're still working from a time-based or cable television network or space. Um, and in actuality, what mixed and augmented reality does is able to bring experiential media inside a physical venue and have throughput of virtual venue to make experiential makeovers of existing spaces. And so that can add, you, then you can change out experiences with very little money. Um, you don't have to have capital improvements. Um, you can increase repeat visits. I mean, I'm talking about experiential venues because that's what a lot of that I'm in. But that also 
works with the augmentation of the mobile device in those experiential venue. So you have to really realize that everywhere you are is an experiential venue, the hospital, school, the conference center, the hotel, hospitality, entertainment center, all of those are embedded between this relationship between mobile devices that are the little device, but also the embedded material. And so what's happening here is that the throughput in, of, of content is going to be traced with new dynamics of, of economics and how that is traced to the creator. And, um, and then it's going to be defined really by the user. So all that innovation is user driven. Um, but the decisions are made from a corporate level. So we're going to go through a real paradigm shift, but economically, we are not going to be making money the way we are today. It's going to be completely different. But you start to see some of the key areas that are be coming together, and it's going to be exponential um, for good content. Bad content, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. It's more of a broader reach, not a here and now thing. OK, more questions? Um, so, have any of y'all uh, developed applications that target specific learning style combinations, like learning kinesthetic, auditory, visual learners, that kind of thing? Or is it still just kind of a, a broad, we're developing lessons and then it's up to the individual to kind of process the information? Or are you going a little bit more micro? We did a study on uh, different cognitive styles of field dependent, field independent, and in, uh, uh, in between. A field dependent being a classroom and, and heavily driven. Uh, we use the same content through the three different learning environments a, a classroom, which is field dependent, a computer lab, which is field independent, and then a museum that's in between. And we tested uh, performance, satisfaction, and attitude change. Uh, we were looking at statistics and, and mathematics and computers. And one of the things we found that the cognitive styles, it didn't matter what cognitive styles they were, they worked just the same, no statistical difference in each of the different environments. What we found is that the environments themselves were significantly different on what they provided in the sense of performance, attitude, and, and satisfaction. We found that the field dependent was much better at performance. Uh, that's a no-brainer, there's a teacher, it's directed. Um, you have the, f the, the museum, which was significantly different than the other two on attitudes, where it, it was a social environment, it was fun, so it was less, you know, because there's a lot of attitude towards math um, and negative attitude. Um, but what the surprise was in the computer lab, um, we found that it was a more satisfaction than the museum and the, and the classroom. And that was surprising because it didn't have the friends there, it didn't have a direction and support, it was all alone with the media. But what we discovered was that we, we hypothesized is that it was a pilot study, it was a, doc, a dissertation written on it, is that because of its own time and own pace and it was directed by the student, that satisfaction was very important. The question is, is that that means that every learning environment in those, one we tested, were at two-thirds deficit of, of being able to do it as well as the others. All venues should be as well as performance attitude and, and satisfaction, and we should be, have better media because a lot of media is, is directed towards one environment or the other. And if media could be, and this is what's advantage of mixed augmented reality, you can use the same media in different learning environments, but we have to address it differently. So the learning environment's probably far different than any cognitive style. When you're talking about learning preferences, aka how Gardner and that so forth, those are preferences. And what the dynamics of simulation is, is that you can work on all those levels and have any one of those entries into the material. It should be addressing all of those types of intelligences, in my opinion. I would just second that I, I think one of the nice things about mixed reality is that it addresses different learning types. And I think that's one of the things that is going to be very powerful about it. Couple more over here. Um, from your from your experience, at what point do schools decide to adopt a new technology like this? Because uh, cost, in terms of man hours and devices, are an entry barrier to adopting like, augmented reality. Um, so, at what point do they decide to make the jump um, to to this step? Um, I, I mean, in, in our case, the, the Avenues is a really unusual school. I mean, they're, they're trying to, they're very deliberately trying to create the school of the future, 
and um, they they have tremendous resources to put towards that. So they were ready to like jump into it and just see what they could do with it, and and that's not going to happen for most schools. Um, but I think that the the what we found was that the real I, what I think is as a positive outcome of this is that um, the barriers may not be quite as high as you think. Um, I mean, if you could put a, uh, if we can put a big timeline, if it could be paper timeline, down a hallway and, um, you know, get uh, one or two iPads into that school that could be shared, you know, that could be a learning experience that uh, kids could have. And the actual cost of creating the content for it, um, I mean, I think what we're going to see, at least in the early days, is there's going to be a lot of volunteer creation of content. And it's going to be a lot of teachers creating content and sharing it with other teachers and using technology to do that. And that's going to be the way that the very earliest um, cases of this could could be rolled out and done across a large scale, a large, uh, across a lot of schools that aren't like avenues. The point is, when it's free, they'll adopt it. Otherwise, you go the political realm, and that's a whole nother gang. It's not really based upon the more logical aspects. But that's a real important important point. It, it's user adoption that's going to bring that in. And if you can address the parents, the students, and the teachers directly, there could be a real avenue to change that model so you don't have to go through over 15,000 school districts in the U.S. alone to, to try to sell your product one door at a time. Um, and so one of the things here with the freemium models and with, you know, techniques on users adapting their spaces, you know, with other people in the communities, from makers or creative people, that's really where it's going to come alive. And so really I see the future as, as turning on bright creative individuals of students who are coming in with this in the school with their phone or teachers who are just wanting something um, and then parents who have a passion for their child to do better. Um, and that's how you, I think it's, it's going to be from the user's point of view in the future. It's not necessarily now. The preschool space is a little bit different in that there's mixed um, opinions by teachers and parents as if media should be in classrooms in general for that young of children. So I think in, from our um, point of view, it's providing quality research that does show that kids can learn and benefit from that. Um, and that's what we're, we're committed to doing. And I think we're excited about this study in general and saying that there is a lot of potential in this space and it's, um, it's, it's a beneficial for children. Yes, but um, the research was done in a, in a preschool classroom context, but in fact the commercial app will oh, be yeah. Uh, it's, it's not designed explicitly for classroom use, though, of course, if, if teachers adopt it, that's terrific. Yeah. And the same thing happened with the military, is that the military developed all this technology, had the throughput, the, their, the readiness level of the technology, and by the time they got to war, the soldiers were using their iPhone. And, you know, it's, it's like, we can't stop that necessarily. We have to kind of get this through. It was a paradigm shift, you know, 10, 20 years ago with the military. It's going to happen with education. It's just, it's, it's moving so fast on the consumer level. Um, that realization, the research is pivotal. It has to be done. And it's in, in the fact that public education can be coming in through television, that's fantastic and it's available. Um, we need other avenues to, to reach. Technology device. So we're actually in the next two years going to see a huge adoption of technology in the classrooms. Now whether it, it depends on what type of devices and there's some like restrictions. So basically it only leaves like in terms of the handhelds like tablets. It, smart, smartphones aren't being able to utilize or else you're looking at laptops or desktops. A lot of districts because they don't have the financing to do it are going directly to a BYO D program, um, which is bring your own device, where kids are actually bringing their own devices to schools. So there is a, there that trend is going to have to happen because the bottom line is that there's only one out of every four kids in school have access to a computer device, and they're going to have to be trained on some kind of technology in order to take the test. 
I think the biggest underutilized facility is the museums. Museums provide very little knowledge, very little experiences, and they don't change. Um, it's a really, they can produce more, they can do more. And I think that your parent is the most important teacher in your lifetime. And the question is, where does your teacher be, learn to be a, when, when, where does your parent learn to be a teacher? And I think these museums, you know, over 14,000 nationwide, should be looking at more having the parents getting involved with their kids because there's no product out there that can help make your kids smarter than just some quality time with their parent. Um, augmented with some technology, even more fantastic, so. Okay, we got uh, one last question over here. Uh, Mindy, you mentioned that, <coughs> that novelty was a factor in having the, the students be engaged. As, um, as the technology becomes more prevalent and the novelty goes away, how do you speculate things will change? I have a feeling we probably won't be designing the exact same way as the technology advances. So as, as it gets better, we get better and we get sharper and we're able to deliver even better content. So I don't see it as something that's like um, a negative. I think it's as like sky, pie in the sky almost. The potential is so great. And these learnings that we've had from this in these few years that we've done some formative research here is dramatically going to impact how we move forward as the technology develops. And I also think that, um, that the technology is novel, and that's part of what's cool about it, definitely. And that's, that, that is huge. And I think, you know, we'll, they'll, that'll keep happening. People are going to keep pushing the envelope and putting, you know, and, and whatever is the latest and greatest is always going to be cool. But also, um, transformation is always magical, especially when you have, uh, when, there's a, when there's a real meaningful relationship between, you know, seeing seeing an object and then looking through a magic window, looking through some kind of, you know, other, looking at it some other way, and then seeing uh, something else, when there's a relationship between the something else and the original thing, um, I, I don't care what kind of technology it's delivered through, that experience is always going to be magical. It's, it's, you know, it's magical in a TV show, it's magical in a movie, it's magical on a web page, and it's magical in augmented reality. And I think so it's a lot of what you were talking about with storytelling and making it engaging, making it something that's exciting. That's going to keep making it interesting all the way through. And when the novelty show goes off, it's, yeah, I can put this virtual thing in the real space. I can see it. It's magical. That magic is just starting. And so that that's a conversation with the author and the audience, which is getting more and more complex in, in, in how do we develop the conventions of that? And I think there's more attention should be done with creative developers on how to make the technology responsive and listen to the user and adapt to the user's individual needs. Um, and that, that could lead in so many different possibilities. It's all creative once the novelty's off. Just say your question. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Oh. Okay. Lunch break. I'll have another session. Around. Yeah. The typical um, the problem in terms of adoption is uh, is adoption by teachers or educators, uh, and also uh, when you look at some uh, use of technology in the classroom, uh, one of the barriers is uh, you know is a time or effort for teachers to develop contents. Edu I mean that is really time taking. Technology itself, you know, it, app is there, but I think at the end of the day, the teachers should organize the contents. How do you, I mean, typically that is some problem. Do you see kind of similar issues in, in this AL, use of AL in the um, education? That's a very good point. Um, and we're also getting out of a phase that we have the, the horse's carriage phase that, you know, Teachers coming in are gamers, and so they're used to it. But what you're going to have is different levels of authorship of content. You're going to be able to get a, a knower display of a, a database uh, simulated. Okay, that's the the natural, you know, simulation. Then you have going to have national educators and entertainers and, and designers develop some interesting area. But they need to leave that content open for then the teacher to be able to come in and customize their area. So it's not too complex that they have to do, but it's dynamic and creative enough so that they have they can own that that lesson. 
in that relationship with their student. And then there's another level of authorship, and that's the user and the learner. And when we design the simulation from the ground up, we have to allow that, that levels of authorship, uh, participation in the authorship. You still have directed objectives, you, you, you have a strategy, you have a program, but you allow the, the user, the teacher, the, the, the venue, and the source to have a participation in that authorship. And we don't necessarily use, do that in broadcast type of, of media. Um, I, I definitely think the danger is to take the broadcast media type of approach. Uh, so I think as you know, technologists and, and content creators that we really should just think that we're taking the first step along the path and provide good resources and examples for what is possible and then leave that freedom open for teachers and students to create content and I, I really do like the idea of levels of authorship, you know, so that there's a, a pathway. And I see this in other fields too, like 3D printing where, you know, the community is kind of coming together to put curriculum together and you have hobbyists, and you have professionals, and you have teachers, and you have students who are all kind of contributing to a knowledge base. So there's no kind of central point for AR content yet, but I, I hope we see something like that soon. And the other thing is that and I, th I think what, what it takes really is it takes somebody willing to go and talk to the teachers and show them and say, no, look, it, you can do this. You know, and I mean, when we, the, the, the teachers that we worked with at, at Avenues were very excited about it, but they also were saying things like, oh, I don't have time to do one more thing, whatever. And then when I showed them like, no, look how easy it is, like, oh, and then they were all over it. Um, and I think it's, so it takes somebody, you know, who's willing to go in and like say, this is how you do it. And then get them to see also that it's not, it's not really creating additional work for them necessarily. It's shifting where their work is happening. Because if you're preparing a lesson, you're preparing a lesson in some way, whether it's a piece of paper or you know, you're making notes or you're doing whatever. You're, you're, you're getting your thoughts together and figuring out your strategies for how you're going to get across the information to your students in some medium. And so this is just a matter of making the augmented reality tools easy enough that they can just shift that labor that they're doing over here in this medium into this other medium, and, and that's it. And the levels of authorship, I mean, learning is not going one way, it's going two ways. So the next generation will always have a better knack at it, but they aren't gonna have nearly experience and knowledge to guide it. And so that relationship between student and a learner and teacher, teaching and learning is going to be an amazing explosion of this dynamics that we have not yet seen. Like I said, AR is going to allow us to kind of rid ourselves of that Victorian era approach. And it's, it's amazing what's going to happen. Thank you. <laughs>